This diagram shows the basics of ultrasound and machine functioning. Something called the piezoelectric effect. Piezo stands for pressure, electric is electricity. Electricity activates the crystal on the head of a probe. These crystals vibrate and send sonographic waves through a liquid medium to an object of interest. Sonographic waves reflect back and the ultrasound machine listens for these waves and translates them onto a screen. Superficial structures create echoes that return quickly to the probe. And this corresponds to something that we call the near field. Echoes from deeper structures take longer to return to the probe. This corresponds to something we call the far field. Echogenesis is, is an important term when we're talking about ultrasound, physics, instruments, and overall description of images and interpretations on the screen. Echogenicity is the ability to return an echo. Echogenicity is higher when the surface reflects an increased number of waves. So for instance, here's an image of the IVC going into the right atrium. The walls of the IVC are hyperechoic or brighter white. The fluid, such as the blood contained within the IVC, and the fluid that we appreciate as pericardial fluid is what we call anechoic, it's black. When we look at this piece of liver, the liver is labeled as isoechoic. Here the echogenicity is consistent with surrounding structures and tissues. Okay, so just for another example of echogenicity, this is a thermal still image of the uterus with bladder, sagittal plane. The bladder is anechoic or black. The myometrium of the uterus is isoechoic. The endometrial stripe is brighter white, hyperechoic. Let's move on to a brief discussion of probes and planes. Next, let's discuss frequency. When we talk about frequency, we, th we talk about units of hertz. The frequency of sound of human hearing is 16 to 20,000 hertz. By definition, ultrasound is greater than 20,000 hertz. When we're talking about the medical application of ultrasound, we're talking of the range 2.5 to 15 megahertz. Here are three probes. On the left is an intracavitary probe. In the center is a linear transducer or probe. And on the right is a tight curvilinear probe. The linear transducer is considered a high frequency probe. We use this to image superficial structures and we don't care so much, we're not as concerned with penetration of waves to a depth. When we're using the low frequency probe on the right, the tight curvilinear, such as we would use to image the abdomen or the heart, we're using a low frequency probe. This allows us deeper penetration of waves, sometimes at the compromise of actually anatomic detail. This is something called the indicator test. The operator is putting gel where the indicator marker is on the probe, and you can see that this corresponds to the dot on the screen. You should always perform an indicator test so you understand your orientation. It's important to understand the orientation of your probe with the screen so that you're accurately imaging the body in different planes. What we're trying to do is approach a three-dimensional object or anatomy in more than one plane. For almost all of your applications, you will image in more than one plane. This diagram gives you a sense of the different planes that we'll be discussing, the sagittal plane, the coronal plane, and the transverse plane. When your probe is oriented in the sagittal plane, you're essentially separating the right-hand part of the body from the left-hand part of the body. Here the operator has the probe marker towards the patient's head. On the right you see the still Im image of how this correlates to the bladder. That dot on the screen corresponds to the head. The other side is the feet. Superficial where the probe is touching the skin is the anterior part of the body. And then deep is the posterior part of the body. Next, a little discussion of the transverse plane. This is also called the axial plane. Here we're perpendicular to the long axis, and you're essentially separating the head from the feet. The operator has the probe marker pointing towards the patient's right. So in the application on the screen, 
where that dot is, the green dot, that corresponds to the patient's right. The other side is the left. Anterior is where your probe is touching the skin. And posterior is deep, deep to the bladder. This is very similar to the orientation from when you're reading a CAT scan. This should be a very familiar view to you. This is the coronal plane. Here we're lateral to the long axis and perpendicular to the transverse. The coronal plane, it's also known as the frontal plane. It separates the anterior part of the body from the posterior part of the body, or in other words, the front from the back. Here the operator has the probe marker pointing towards the patient's head, and this is a right upper quadrant view that commonly is used to perform the FAST examination. If you look at the still image, you can see the probe marker where the dot is corresponds to the head. The other side is the feet. The top of the screen is medial or, or belly up. And the posterior part, or what's labeled as lateral, is deep to where the flank is. Next, a brief discussion of modes and knobs. The four modes that we will briefly cover are 2D, M mode, Doppler mode, and color flow mode. This is a video image example of 2D, also called grayscale, also called B mode. B stands for brightness because essentially the machine is modulating the brightness of dots. It's a translation of the amplitude of the sonographic waves onto the screen for different grayscale. This should be an image that's very familiar to you. Anatomically, we're looking at the liver, the right kidney, the bright white diaphragm, which is hyperechoic, and anechoic fluid above the diaphragm. This patient has a pleural effusion. The next mode is M mode. M stands for motion. Here, the motion of the mobile structures can be observed. Essentially, one piezoelectric channel is plotted over time, and this gives a real-time representation of a moving object, in this case, such as a fetal heart. Here is an example of pulse wave spectral Doppler mode. Simply stated, Doppler mode examines the characteristics of the direction and speed of tissue motion and blood flow. Usually this is presented in an audible, color, or spectral display. So this is a spectral display. What we can see is arterial flow is a triangular shape over time. The final mode we're going to discuss is color flow, or color Doppler ultrasound. What we're able to see is frequency shifts going, coming towards and moving away from the transducer. The color blood flow or tissue motion is translated into a color. It's color coded and superimposed over the B mode image. In this case, red is towards the probe and blue is away from the probe. Once you familiarize yourself with the location of your mode buttons, find your depth button. To optimize image quality, you want to optimize your depth. On the left and on the right, we're looking at a sub xiphoid view of the heart. When you're evaluating the heart, you probably want to be able to evaluate for pericardial effusion. So you need to see the posterior pericardium. On the left, you want to increase your depth. On the right, you want to decrease your depth. It's important to note that with depth, you preserve your image resolution, as opposed to when you use a zoom button, you do not preserve your resolution. Here's another example using still images. We're looking at the bladder. On the left, you have too much depth. Your sonographic waves are traveling well beyond the posterior part of the bladder, beyond the area of interest. On the right, your depth has been decreased and you're able to evaluate your structure of interest with a good amount of anatomy seen posterior to the bladder. The gain button. Gain adjusts the amount of intensity of the signal that's returning to your machine. As the gain is increased, the amount of signal is increased and the image appears brighter. As the gain is decreased, the amount of signal that returns to the machine is decreased and your image becomes darker.
The time gain compensation. The time gain compensation controls the gain at different levels of the ultrasound image. We know that ultrasound waves tend to be attenuated with distance. TGC, the time gain compensation, allows you to differentially amplify the echoes returning from deeper structures so you get a nice symmetric image on the screen. Here you can see that the operator is adjusting the near field, making it brighter, and now you can see that the operator is adjusting the far field. making it brighter. The goal is to have a nice symmetric image on the screen. Okay, as a final part of this lecture, I'm gonna briefly discuss artifacts. What exactly are image artifacts? Well, one definition is that it's any echo information that does not correspond to accurate anatomical information. So in other words, we're performing ultrasound, we're obtaining images on the screen, and we're trying to interpret what we're seeing on the screen. There's accurate interpretation of the images, which requires an understanding of anatomy and anatomic reflections. We expect to see these on the screen. But then there are non-anatomic non signals that appear as the result of artifacts. So what exactly am I talking about in terms of some concrete types of artifacts? You'll see on the upper left a list of five artifacts that I'm going to cover. Reverberation, edge artifact, mirror image, posterior enhancement, and shadowing. First, reverberation. So by definition, what is reverberation? Uh, reverberation is a bouncing between two highly reflective objects or two highly reflective surfaces. So here we're looking at lung sliding. We're seeing a rib with shadow, hyperechoic bright white line, and another rib with shadow. The type of reverberation artifact we're seeing here are B lines. So in a normal lung, the reverberation produces A lines. A lines are equidistant from the actual pleura and they're horizontal. However, in this video clip, we're seeing vertical lines. These vertical reverberation lines are due to the interstitial syndrome. So this might be something that you would see with congestive heart failure, perhaps a pneumonia, okay? Um, these are bright white comet tail artifacts that are starting from the pleura and going all the way down, extending to the far field of the image, to the edge of the screen. Before I move on to edge artifact, let me make a comment regarding ver reverberation. Some of you may have asked yourself, well, what about comet tail? What about ring down? And you're absolutely right. Those are different kinds of reverberation artifact. I just showed you an example of beelines. Uh, which are lung rockets. So uh, in the case of, say, uh, placing a central line with the needle in the vessel, you will see distal reflections of the needle, and that's called ring down. That is absolutely a type of reverberation. But now we're going to talk about edge artifact. So edge artifact is a result of refraction, refraction of the sonographic waves. Uh, because of this, shadows may occur because the changes um, in the beam of the old sound, they're changing direction. So by definition, a change in the sound beam direction results because there's an oblique incidence of the sound beam as it crosses the boundary of tissues, um, tissues that have different propagation um, speeds, uh, and specifically uh, curved structures. So here we're looking and seeing reverberation that's occurring because of the gallbladder, the curved gallbladder wall. Here's another example. We're seeing some uh, reverberation, some refraction of sonographic waves with the bowel. Now here the bowel is um, peristalsing, and it's partially solid and partially liquid feel filled. And uh, with edge artifact here, um, you can see that it almost looks like there's um, shadowing, almost as if there were stones in the bowel wall, however there are not. So this is a normal finding. This is something that you will see because of the refraction of the sonographic waves. Um, as they're hitting a curved surface. The next artifact I'm going to discuss is mirror imaging. And for many of us, this is a favorite artifact. The video on top is normal. We're looking at the right upper quadrant. You can see liver, a little bit of kidney, and the bright white highly reflector, which is the diaphragm. It looks like there is liver above the diaphragm and liver below the diaphragm. This is due to mirror Im image artifact, and this is a normal finding. The video below, you lost your mirror imaging. Essentially, you're seeing liver, the bright white diaphragm, and there's fluid above the diaphragm, so you've lost your mirror imaging. 
So essentially, mirror artifacts uh, occur when objects appear on both sides of a strong reflector. The reflector here is the diaphragm. If I were to try to understand and explain the physics to you, um, because it is an ongoing understanding, um, ultrasound assumes that sound travels in a straight line, okay? So the distance or depth of the reflector is proportional to the travel time necessary to make the return trip back um, to the sonographic unit. However, when the ultrasound beam undergoes multiple reflections because it's hitting the strong reflector, an incorrect interpretation of the signal timing occurs and it results in the duplication of the structure. So here it looks like there's a duplication of the liver. All right, next artifact. Here we're looking at a picture of the bladder. And what you can appreciate, for those of you that have the trained eye and have been introduced to the physics, is there's posterior enhancement, or hyperechoic look, to the posterior portion of the bladder. This is called posterior enhancement. Essentially, sound waves that are traveling to areas of lower attenuation cause this posterior acoustic enhancement. And you can also see this if you're imaging the gallbladder. So quite simply, simply the opposite of attenuation is what occurs with posterior acoustic enhancement. Sound passes through an ultrasound-friendly structure, such as a cyst or a uh, urine-filled bladder, a distended gallbladder, and less attenuation of the signal occurs because these are very sonographic uh, friendly structures. So as a result, a greater amount of acoustic energy is available when it hits the posterior part of the, of the bladder wall. And essentially, there's an increase in acoustic energy causing an increase in echogenicity or a bright white hyperechoic look to that posterior part of the wall. This is very much il illustrated in this video clip view. The final and fifth artifact I'm going to briefly discuss is shadowing. And uh, this is a favorite for many of us in addition to mirror imaging. So the top video clip, we're seeing shadowing that's occurring in the lung. We're seeing a rib with posterior shadowing. And then on either side of that rib is the highly reflective bright white pleura. The video clip below is we're seeing shadowing from what? Lots of gallbladder stones. We'll call this a gallstone village. What's going on in terms of the physics is the ultrasonographic waves are hitting a highly reflective surface. Uh, in one case, the bone, which is the rib, and in another case, the stones, which are calcified. The sound encounters this highly reflective um, surface, and the reflected energy is returned back to the transducer. Little acoustic energy goes beyond it and is available to travel beyond. Consequently, we see what we call clean shadows or uh, the black hypochoic area. No sonographic waves are traveling beyond the highly reflective surfaces. As I conclude this lecture, I'd like to take a, a brief moment to discuss the ALARA principle. ALARA is an acronym, and it stands for as low as reasonably achievable. AIUM, the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, adopted this acronym. The term reminds us as physicians, sonographers, and operators that the amount of time for an examination along with the equipment, the settings, all contribute to the prudent use of diagnostic ultrasound. Okay, we want to minimize any risk, any exposure to our patients as low as reasonably achievable. So let me summarize for you in particular the artifacts. We discussed reverberation which can be seen with a foreign body, such as a needle introduced uh, into a vessel, or such as what we saw at the interface of the pleura with lung sliding. Edge artifact is what can be seen at curved structures, fluid-filled, liquid-filled, uh, otherwise, such as cysts, bowel, or the gallbladder. Mirror imaging, a favorite, is seeing the highly reflective surface of the diaphragm. You can also see mirror imaging when you're uh, imaging the heart, as well as other structures, because the pericardium is also a highly reflective surface. Posterior enhancement, seen a lot with cysts, the bladder, fluid-filled structure that are very uh, echo-friendly when there's a lot of, uh, when there's minimal acoustic enhancement and a lot of acoustic energy. And finally, shadowing bones, stones, the rib, gallstones, etc. These artifacts will help you 
in interpreting your ultrasonographic images and ultimately making patient care decisions. Finally, I would like to say thank you. Thank you to the St. Luke's Roosevelt Ultrasound Division. Thank you to Manny Colon, a friend and colleague in Puerto Rico who trained with us many years ago and is responsible for some of the initial animations that you saw in this lecture. And finally, to Megan Kelly Herbst. This is uh, a project of passion for her. She uh, has been patient. She's provided excellent feedback and guidance, and uh, she should be recognized for all the work of the SAM Narrated Lecture Series. Thank you very much.